21 years ago this morning, if you were old enough back then to be aware of what was happening, you likely remember exactly where you were and exactly what happened. 9-11-2001 is a date that is forever burned into our country's consciousness. We knew the world wasn't the friendliest of places. Many of us as young kids remember seeing frequently on the nightly news about conflicts and unrest taking place in other parts of the world. But when all that stuff starts to make its way to our country, to our streets, and starts killing our people, we never really expected something like that to happen. This image that's been up shows us what lower Manhattan looked like that morning. Dust and debris literally everywhere after the World Trade Center buildings collapsed. How is it that people hate us so much that they would steal our planes and fly into our buildings to kill some of us? With such malice that that giving up their own lives to take us out seemed worth it to them. This morning, I want us to think about how in the world do people in other parts of the world hate us so much. The title of the message today is, I Hate You. And I want to be really clear here right out of the gate. Uh, There's something that I am not talking about at all. And I want to give you uh, some examples of this. I am not talking about American exceptionalism. Now you might say, Rob, what in the world is American exceptionalism? So two examples I have for you. The first is, uh, many of you know this, I was born and raised in Canada. So I grew up in a different country. And uh, everybody who knows anything about this knows that there's one thing that Canadians are the best at, right? We are the best at hockey. And when I was a kid, and even when I was a much younger adult, uh, it's amazing, uh, you know, Canada was right up there, and the other countries that competed with Canada were usually Sweden, maybe Finland sometimes, uh, maybe Russia's team. Um, But the United States, other than, you know, certain times, maybe uh, certain years, they were okay, uh, but really wasn't in the conversation. And actually, it's interesting, when I'm home, some of my buddies who are big time into hockey, we talk about this, how the Americans have this idea, and it's awesome, right? We're like, hey, if we want to become better at something, uh, there's literally no stopping us. And it's true, actually, just last week, Team Canada, the women, uh, beat the American team uh, for the top spot in some world uh, competition, but it was by one goal. And at the last number of Olympics, it's always been the Canadians and the Americans. Because see, here's the thing. Most countries have a stopping point, right? They say, hey, we've done everything we could possibly do, and this is just our best. But here in the States, like what we think is if we want to do something, if we want to accomplish something, if we want to be better at something, we keep going until we get there. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It doesn't matter how much it costs us. We are that committed to success. And it's awesome. It's just a great part of our our psyche and our country and our culture. Another example uh, that I want to give here, um, again, that I'm not talking about uh, is, and and we're great at this, um, is our military. Um, We actually, as a church, right now have two young people who are off training to protect and defend our country. And uh, they're at their respective boot camps. And I want you to look at this image. So if you look at the right side of the screen on the rope, Uh, You see Miranda Forbes, who's off at uh, National Guard basic training. Uh, Her mom sent me that picture because she said it's one of the ones where she's actually smiling instead of, you know, being whatever, tortured (laughs) or whatever they do to get people ready. And then on the left side of your screen, it's much harder to kind of pick him out, even though he's like a gazillion feet tall, is Camden Stanton, who I affectionately refer to as Ginger Thunder uh, because he has reddish hair. But you can see him. He's more in sort of the top 
uh, left of the picture by that yellow flag. He's kind of the, the taller uh, one looking at us, and he's at Marine Corps basic training. And I just want to say this. We, as a church, I am so thankful for all who have, who are, and who will fight to defend our freedom. Uh, this message is not in any way, shape, or form about bashing our country or our military. This is not about kneeling for our anthem or diminishing our flag. We all have allegiance to a much higher kingdom and a much greater king than country, uh, but we are also so thankful for our heritage. Uh, we're thankful to be a part of the country, uh, albeit as imperfect as it is, uh, that we are. And you know what? I'm, I'm thankful too, because we got to remember this, right? Freedom is a knife that cuts both ways. I am thankful that we live in a country where people can do things and even protest in ways that I would never do, and maybe even that I don't agree with, but that's part of freedom, right? People get to make some of those choices for themselves. They, they can choose to do things that I wouldn't do or you wouldn't do, and, and that's part of it. Um, so even with all that said, the point is this. Uh, we still have a reputation problem, all right? As a, as a country, as a culture, and all the subsets in our country and culture, American Christians, we have a reputation problem. And, and just to think about this, and I alluded to this a little bit last week, if you tuned in or you were here, um, is mind-blowing to me. And let me just give you one stat to, to sort of illustrate how mind-blowing this is. From October 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2020, our government sent 51.05 billion U.S. dollars in, in assistance to foreign countries. So we, we, we sent out to other places just to, 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 to help, to, to bless, to be present, um, over 50 billion with a b right dollars uh just to help others um we do so much we send military we send people um so for people to hate us is mind-blowing and and just to sort of in a moment of full transparency there's times where i've been in other countries in other parts of the world and people who I know or have known for a while will literally look at me and, and reflecting on our country and our behavior, whether that's with politics or whether that's just with our opinions or our utter uh, sort of um, uh, unwillingness to be good global citizens in certain ways. People will literally look at me and honestly, like the words I've heard these dozens of times, people will say, Rob, what the hell? Like, what is going on? Why is it that, that you guys, that your country, that your politicians, that your people behave in this way? Like, the rest of the world sort of looks at us and goes, I just don't get it. Like, nobody is doing that. Nobody would do that. Nobody should do that. But you guys are doing that. We have a reputation problem. So let me say it this way. Today is going to be super simple. Uh, we have this problem, um, and I want to give us some examples of it, and I want to talk about what the problem is more specifically, but I also want to talk about the solution. What can we do so that this gets better, so that our reputation, uh, and we do so much good stuff, so we should have a, a good reputation. What can we do to make things better and improve this? So there is a solution and I'm excited for us not only to think about it, but to start applying it to our lives in even greater ways. And so Jesus, today, I thank you that we can be in this place together. We want to remember those whose lives were lost um, for, for no good reason 21 years ago. We're so thankful for so many people who who serve to, to, to fight and protect our freedom. Uh, we're thankful for the freedoms that we do have and the blessings that exist in our country and in our culture. 
But Lord, today I just want to ask for all of us that you would, as we're talking about in this series, give us a sense of how we cannot sort of live for or lean into our culture and our culture's preferences uh, and our culture's tendencies. But Jesus, today I just pray that we would hear very clearly from the scriptures uh, what it is that God wants for us. And may we lean that direction. Jesus, may we see very clearly your heart for how your people ought to live and, and exist in this world. We ask these things together today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, I want us to, to look at a couple places in the scripture today. And for us to understand the problem a little bit more, uh, there's this great proverb. It's actually Proverbs 22.1. And it says this, A good name is is more desirable than great riches. Cool, right? A good name is more desirable than great riches. And then to be esteemed, right? To be thought of well, to be lifted up, to be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Such a, such a, it's such a simple thought, right? Uh, and the idea is this. What people think when they think about you and when they think about me, is more important than all the money in the world, right? So we could be filthy rich. We could do anything we want. We could buy anything we want. Uh, and if we had that kind of wealth, uh, it's still not as important, not as impactful as having a good name, as having a good reputation, as, as being well thought of. And here's the truth, right? We all, we all could use a little more money, right? Anybody else, right? So we all want more money. In a lot of respects, we in some ways need more money, but we can't always control that. We can't always control just how much money we have, right? Just how much money we earn. But people thinking well of us matters more than, um, than having money, the money we need, the money we want, all that stuff. And we can all do things, we can all live in ways that directly impact how people think of us. We can all do things that, that improve and increase our reputation. So let me say it this way. Our reputation matters mega, right? Not just more, it matters like mega. It's like, it, 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 you almost can't think of something that matters more than this. Uh, and here's the truth. If you have a good reputation, it's hard to mess it up, right? If people think well of you, you get the benefit of the doubt. Uh, people, like, they're like, oh, no, that person would never do that. If you have a bad reputation, on the other hand, it can feel like it's almost impossible to overcome that. And sometimes we inherit that just because there's other people in our category, whether that's like as a Christian or in the family we live or whatever, someone else did something a long time ago and that then reflects on us. That's, that's part of this deal too, isn't it? Um, so a good reputation is hard to mess up. Uh, once you have it, it helps you in life. But if you have a bad reputation, whether you got that directly or indirectly, um, it can sometimes feel impossible to overcome, like nobody ever gives you the benefit of the doubt. When I was 14 years old, I decided to follow Jesus. This was the summer uh, between my eighth grade year and going into high school, my ninth grade year. And so I get to high school, and, uh, and I still remember, like, so for my whole high school career, most of my friends only knew me as a follower of Jesus. They didn't know me sort of before that, and I really tried hard um, to do all the things that you're supposed to do. I was also an athlete, and so I don't remember which, which year it was or which grade it was, but people for years at this point, two, three years, knew that I was a serious, committed Christian, that I tried my best to live for Jesus. And, uh, and the, the one context where sometimes maybe that wavered a little bit uh, was kind of in the heat of battle um, as I was playing sports. And I have a number of stories like this where, you know, something less than ideal happens and just sort of that knee-jerk reaction, that thing that might fly out of your mouth, hopefully quiet enough under your breath where not everyone's hearing it, 
uh, you know, isn't really the most God-honoring thing. I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, and so I remember being at this basketball game. I actually remember which, which school we were playing. We were at their gym. And I, re- I don't remember if I got called for a foul or um, what, something happened. The ref blew the whistle, and I, I did not think it was right or fair. And the thing that came out of my mouth, again, somewhat quietly and under my breath, was highly inappropriate. Well, it just so happened that the ref heard that and blew the whistle, gave me a technical for swearing. And, uh, and I, it, I remember because my teammates, when they heard the ref report that, all together stood up like, no way, he would never do that. And, and if I'm being honest with you, I was embarrassed, right? Because my good reputation, the things that my teammates knew about me was untrue, but they gave me the benefit of the doubt, even though I got whistled for something that I 100% did. And so, you know, in a situation like that, what should I do? When I went over to the bench and they were like, they had my back and they're like, I can't believe he thought you did that. I sort of, I made a decision and, and, you know, maybe uh, one above my maturity level for that age, but I kind of hung my head and I was honest and said, no guys, I, I actually did that. Because you know what, that's part of the deal too, right? Like being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean we get everything right and we're perfect all the time, but part of it should mean that when we're imperfect, when we, when we do a lesser thing, when we miss the mark, that we're honest about that, we take responsibility and we own it. You know, I think it's really easy as we think about this idea of having a bad global reputation or even being hated by other people in other parts of the world. It's really easy to say things like, well, they're just jealous. They want what we have. And and in some respects, I'm sure that's true. Or in in some of these more extreme uh, situations, it's really easy for us to think Oh, they're just crazy, right? Like, no, nobody would do that unless they were crazy. So it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with them. And you know what? In, in some ways, that may even have some truth to it. But listen, I always tell this to my boys when they come to me to tell me why something happened to explain a situation, and they want to immediately jump into what everyone else did or what the other person did. And I, I've told them this for years, and they've actually gotten fairly good at it. I'm like, listen, when you come to me, I want the first thing you do um, to be you taking responsibility for your part. I don't care if your part is 1% of the problem and 99% of the problem or the blame or whatever lies with someone else. At the very least, you take responsibility for your actions. We are always right and we're always happy to tell everyone we're right. You know, that's just true about us, isn't it? As a country, as a culture, we know we're right and we want to let other people know that we're right. Now let me ask you uh, just a personal question. If you have someone like this in your life, around your life, it could be a family member, it could be a friend, um, whatever, who's always right. They're always right, whether they're right or not, they're always right, and they're always happy to tell you they're right, and they want to let you know, oh, no, 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 here's how you do that, because I'm right, and I know this, and you might not know this yet. If, If you have someone like this in your life or around your life, do you go out of your way to be around them more or spend more time with them? The answer is absolutely not, right? Like, um, and, and you know what? Those people can even be really smart and, and right most of the time, but someone who always thinks and knows they're right and always wants to tell you, man, these are very difficult people to be around. They're very difficult people to spend time with. That's how we are as an entire country and culture. No wonder that we're not loved Um, as much maybe as we should be. We go where we want. We do what we want. We sometimes even arm, right? Give 
give guns and, and bombs and supplies. We arm bad guys so they can win a conflict when that's uh, in our best interest as a country. And listen, I'm not even saying that that's not the right thing to do, but can you imagine that? Can you imagine, you know, sort of having your, your arch enemy in another part of the world and you are in this conflict and maybe you've worked hard and you've had a lot of casualties and you're winning and all of a sudden... Uh, now the, the people that you were actually winning, kind of when it was like fair and even against, now the Americans have dropped off a lot more high-powered stuff and now they wipe you off the face of the earth. Can you see how if you see that happen, you've experienced that, how that may cause some animosity toward us and toward our country? Um, can you see how that maybe wouldn't be the best way to make friends and influence people. Uh, it's the same in the church. And, and I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, years ago, I remember watching this, and it was, and I uh, watched it, someone told me about it, and I went and looked it up. And, and it was some harsh cultural commentary from uh, a TV show that probably m some of you wouldn't watch or, or wouldn't recommend, and I'm not really recommending it per se, but, uh, but the one thing they do well is they give uh, accurate critique in a, in a blown up way of things in our culture and in our country. So uh, the show is South Park, and, uh, and I remember this specific episode because um, somebody from space lands in their spaceship, and it's in a place like Ethiopia, you know, some third world sort of desert uh, setting country. And, and it's weird because the person comes out of their little flying saucer, and looks around, and it's just desert and emaciated people laying on the ground. And then the, as the camera's panning, it pans to where the missionaries and the church is. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the desert, it's beautiful green grass, a white picket fence. And then uh, it takes us inside the building. And so this person from space who knows nothing about our culture is seeing all this and ends up um, going inside the church to sort of see what else is going on. And the missionaries in there, and I have a picture here, uh, and the missionary says these words, remember children, reading the Bible plus accepting Jesus equals food. And I just remember, again, as somebody who loves Jesus and loves the idea that we can go anywhere and everywhere in the world to help people see, know, and experience Jesus in ways that change their lives now and for all eternity, like to see that commentary just was like a dagger in my heart. And so, so like uh, the person jumps into the spaceship because they're like, I want to get out of here. Like, I don't want to be anywhere close to these Christians. And I think their first stop, they're in Australia, and the language they speak, nobody understands. So they're like, who would be able to help with this? Oh, maybe the missionaries would be able to help. And as soon as this person hears that, they hop back in the spaceship and take off because the idea is just arriving on our planet and seeing this without any context, without any feelings or thoughts for or against Christians, but watching their behavior, the idea was, I'm getting out of here because I don't want to have to deal with those people. Um, and for a long time, that was one of our approaches to missions, right? We would go to another part of the world and we would know better, right? We're going to bring our wisdom and our techniques and our wealth and we're going to help you guys because obviously you can't get it done. See, when we show up knowing everything and doing everything, and sometimes we think that's really helpful, um, but long term it's not. And I am so thankful that modern missions is a lot more about us going to other parts of the world and helping equip and, and support and train indigenous people to do the work in the places they live and their countries um, because I think that is going to make and is making a much bigger and more long-term difference. But can you see that? Can you see how us showing up as the know-it-alls who have all the, the right techniques and processes and, and money and whatever um, is not the best way, again, to make friends and influence people, right? Like that's not endearing us to others. Now where we live 
in the rural Midwest. We're a little bit insulated from this, but about a month ago, I was on a coaching call, a Zoom call, with somebody uh, who I am coaching who is in the process of planting a church. And I was talking to them about where they live. They live down in uh, the Carolinas in a little area that's referred to as the Triangle because it is uh, the research triangle because it's right in this triangle uh, between three predominant schools. Duke um, is there, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, and North Carolina State are the three schools. And so there's a lot of really smart people. um, And actually, this church planner's spouse is a scientist Uh, at Duke. And um, she, a month ago, told me a couple things about that culture. And and you know what? The Carolinas are like the Bible Belt, right? So you probably go an hour from there, and everybody goes to church, and you know, all that kind of stuff. But here in this, this one area, you get more of a peek into what's happening in a lot of our big cities, on our coasts, Uh, in a lot of parts of our culture, again, that we here where we live are are insulated from this. She said, uh, Christians now where they live are now viewed as immoral. So the starting point in people's minds for people of faith, because of what they've witnessed over and over again for a long time, is that if you are a Christian, you are immoral. Why is that? Well, because Christians are viewed as people who... um, you know, are, uh, you, hey, you, you have your opinion and perspective, and then that causes us to be unkind in the way that we walk through the world and, and we treat others. Um, it just causes us to behave poorly because I'm right and God's on my side and you're wrong and I'm happy to tell you. And, and so that, for like a long period of time, has resulted in this, this thing where, She's like, it's strange, like people will meet us and we'll be trying to be friendly and want to invite people over maybe to have a meal or whatever. But if they, if they discover quickly that we are people of faith, people are very skeptical and we're viewed as immoral. In fact, she meant, uh, the, the church planner mentioned that their spouse um, uh, in the, the group that uh, the spouse works in, um, there's another one of the scientists who's actually a witch and has all kinds of things around their desk that sort of are, are witch things. I don't, I don't know what the things are. Uh, but they mentioned that people in the, in the group actually respect the witch and look at their spouse as, like we found out you were a Christian, and we know that Christians are immoral. That's their starting point. And so the witch is kind of thought of higher, and the Christian is thought of as lesser. And I know, I know what we do, right? We all do this. As people of faith, we're like, oh, here we go. The world just does that. It says we should be tolerant of everybody, and we need to treat everybody the same, but we are treated poorly, and everybody else is treated better, and it's not fair. But church, we've got to remember that literally forever in our country, we were the majority. We were the voice. We were the conscience. And people felt like we felt and believed like we believed and thought like we thought. And when that was true, not just for tens of years, but for hundreds of years, um, people who disagreed with us, again, uh, even if they were wrong or are wrong, right? We treated them like that. We didn't give them any dignity. We didn't listen to them. We didn't even try to understand. We were right, and we were happy to tell them that. And then we wonder why when things shift and we begin to be less of the dominant voice in our culture and in our country, why people treat us poorly. Well, it's in a large respect because we are now reaping what we have sowed for so long. So here's the problem. I want to just say it in a very succinct way. The problem is that we are ethnocentric and we are arrogant. This is why we have 
a reputation problem. This is why people hate us. This is why people in certain parts of the world are, are even happy to give their own lives to take some of us out because we are so ethnocentric and we are so arrogant. So you might say, well, Rob, I've never heard that term ethnocentric before. What does it mean? Ethno, right? An ethnicity centric center. It means that we believe as a culture that we are the center of everything, right? We're the center of the world. Like everything revolves around us. And you might think, well, Rob, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't think that way. I don't feel that way. L let me just give you one example. What other place on the earth, what other country, what other people group travels to any part of the world and says, I can't believe this. I've come here and they don't even speak my language. They need to speak English. And then at the same time, when people from other parts of the world move to our country and can't yet speak English or speak English well, we roll our eyes and go, oh, I can't believe this. They live here. They need to speak English, right? Now, do you see, do you see the conflict there? We go to a different part of the world expecting that they should speak our language. Most of the time they do. Um, and then people come here and we expect them to speak our language. Like, we, we just expect it to be both ways based on what we prefer, what would be better for us, not thinking about anyone else. So as we think about this sort of arrogance, this entitlement, this sort of we are the center of all things, how does that fit with the text we heard last week from Ephesians 4? Paul says, I therefore... Uh, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Well, what does that look like? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain unity in the spirit, in the bond of peace. You know, uh, we, we kind of know and see how as a culture we live, but the scriptures really challenge this. They really push into us and invite us to a different way. Let's think about a different one. James 1.19 says this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Ugh, right? Like, because we are... Uh, not quick to listen. We are quick to speak and we're slow to listen and then we're quick to become angry. And, and so even though the scriptures say these things over and over again very clearly, we are still not gentle. We're still not super patient. We're still not very loving. We still speak way more than we listen. I, I remember a number of years ago I was trained to be a coach uh, for pastors and church planters. And, uh, and then I was trained to terrain coaches. Um, and so um, I've done some of that work. And the coaching system that we learned was really one where the job is to listen to the person you're coaching and to help them do things the way that God has created them to do it. It's not to say, well, here's how I would do it. And so you need to now do what I would do in the way that I would do it. That usually doesn't work, right? Um, and, uh, and it was amazing to me how many of the people and leaders around that process, they, they would get confused sometimes and go, wait, 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 wait. If, if you're a coach of someone, when's the time where you actually just tell them what to do? Because, man, if I'm paying you to coach someone else, you know, I might need them to do something, and so I want to be able to tell you, and then you can tell them as the coach, you need to do this, right? But, but that, when we think about it logically, that doesn't work. What happens when you or I go to the doctor, and the doctor says, do this? And we do it half-heartedly, it doesn't work, nothing changes, and we go, eh, the doctor was wrong, right? All that does is give us someone else to blame. We put the responsibility on somebody else, uh, and so when we are equipped to do things the way that God has made us to do, there's only one person that has the responsibility, right? It's us. If I'm like, well, here's the step I'm going to take, or here's how I would do that. Uh, but again, in the American mind, the idea of coaching that doesn't involve me telling you what to do was really foreign, and leaders struggled with that. 
And because of this, again, we have a huge reputation problem that keeps people from liking us as a country and as a culture. Um, So I remember as a teenager, I bought this big poster. You've seen these posters. They're motivational. They have some beautiful picture on them, a word, and then a little saying or a definition, excellence or success. This poster had the word achievement on it. And the picture, in high school, I skied a ton. I love downhill skiing. And uh, the picture was somebody literally jumping off of a mountain and falling hundreds of feet into uh, a big powdery area on the mountain. And it was, they were just kind of like falling through the air. And it was just beautiful and awesome. This was intentional, not, ah, you know, like falling to my death like uh, the Roadrunner and Coyote. Um, and, uh, and so it said achievement, and then the quote was this. And I loved this quote. It said, if you done it, it ain't bragging. Right? Like, if you've done it, if you've actually done it, it's not bragging, right? Because you're just sort of saying what you did. I loved that. And again, this is part of the problem, right? Because as you're hearing that, some of you are like, that's so cool, right? Like, I would have loved that poster too. I still have it uh, somewhere. I think it's wrapped in cardboard and, and waiting to be unpacked and taken out. It's been that way for a long time. Uh, and so as a, as, a, as a country, as a culture, some of us think like this, right? Well, Rob, 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 no, no, no. Like, the rest of the world has gotten it all wrong. Uh, we aren't arrogant. I'm not arrogant. I'm just stating facts, Right? We're not being arrogant. We've actually done those things. We've helped in those ways. We've figured this problem out. I'm not arrogant. I'm just telling the truth. I'm just stating facts. Listen, if you're married, uh, if you have a job, um, if you live life with other people, try doing this with your spouse. Try doing this with your boss. Try doing this with your friends right, where you are just like, hey, I'm not arrogant, I'm just right, so let me just lay down the truth and tell you facts, and just like keep doing that, and keep having that posture of I'm always right, but I'm not arrogant, I'm just right, and so I'm just telling you the truth, do that, see how that works for you, see how your marriage goes, see how your your boss starts to sort of change in how they think about you, see if your friends want you to be around more or less, right? How do you think that's going to go? It's not going to go well. Um, so we have a reputation problems that are a problem that stems from arrogance. And so the question is this, what can we do about this? Well, Rob, we need to tell them the truth, right? We're here in a boxing ring. Let's tell them the truth. Let's fight for the truth. Let's fight to change their minds. Jesus actually gives us an incredible example of what we should do when people view us as, and maybe even if we're honest, we have a tendency toward arrogance. Um, And this is one of my favorite passages in the entire New Testament. I actually remember back in college, a friend of mine who was a music major wrote a song to this passage of scripture. And I still remember it. I'd sing it for you, but you don't want that. Uh, It's from Philippians 2. And I just want us to look at verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Really a short passage. Let me read it over you. And then we're going to quickly walk through it. So here's what the text says. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature with God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Ugh. Um, Just just a a mind-blowing passage, a breathtaking passage to think of jesus this way so let's let's just look through these verses quickly one at a time because they all sort of flow together so here's how it starts in your relationships with one another uh, philippians 5 uh, 2 5 
uh, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Um, And so what this is really telling us here at the very beginning is when it comes to our reputation, how we actually live our lives matters. It doesn't just matter that we send help and people and money when others have needs. That's that's not enough. Like how we live, um, how we live every single day matters. And actually, uh, take it one step further, living like Jesus matters. Having his mindset and having similar actions, outward actions, thinking like he does, speaking like he does, living like he did, this matters. Remember what we've been saying? Uh, There's the clear teaching of Scripture. When the Scriptures are clear, that's important. And that's trumped only what? By what? By Jesus, right? Uh, and, and we see Jesus do this all the time through the scriptures, don't we? Like he will, he'll say to people, you have heard it said, right? Like it used to be this way, but I tell you, Jesus is like changing things up. He's updating the rules. And a lot of times he ups the ante, he doesn't lower it, right? So there's the clear teaching of scripture, but it's only trumped by Jesus, Jesus' heart. What would Jesus do? You've heard it said, but I tell you. So the real question here is this. What is Jesus' mindset um, that we um, are to have, especially in our relationships with others, right? In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Well, what is that? What was his mindset? How did he live? The answer, again, is, is really breathtaking. The next verse says this in Philippians 2, 6. Who being in very nature... God, don't miss that, did not consider equality. He was, he was God. He was equal to God. Um, who, he was in very nature God, but he didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So Jesus was God. He was made of the same stuff. That, that idea of being in very nature God, the theological term actually is essence, which basically means like made of the exact same stuff. Like what, who they are, what they're made up of is the same. And, and what we need to know about Jesus in particular, even though he was born as a human being, came and lived on planet Earth as a man, um, he was the only human who has ever been perfect. He's the only one uh, who uh, has never fallen, failed, and sinned, right? So Jesus is, is it. And that allowed him to become the perfect sacrifice once for all, for all humanity. So it was important that he lived that way. So here's Jesus um, uh, who was God and was made of the same stuff as God. He was perfect and deserved everything. So, so think about this though, right? Because what, is, what does the text say? He, but he didn't consider that, that Godness that he was as something that he could or should use for his own advantage. So, so the idea is this. He was the most, but he chose less, right? He was the most, he deserved the most, but he chose something less. Um, I'm not going to use my divinity, right, my 100% God side, to my own advantage. He was God, but he didn't grasp for that. He didn't reach for that I am God level, even though it was true, even though he could have, even though like many of us, most of us, maybe all of us, we would do this. It's sort of like a movie, right? We've seen movies like this. It's a typical plot where there's a star maybe of a sports thing and and they have a, 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 a maturing moment. They've, they've grown up, and so they want to be a better team player, right? And so instead of just hogging the ball and doing it all themselves, they, they become a better uh, a teammate. But at some point, right, that star does something, or that star shines in the, in the championship game, and so the team wins. That's kind of like this, right? Jesus doesn't want to show off with his divinity, but from time to time, he's like, pa pa right? And kind of does that just to be fancy and impressive, right? No, he doesn't. It's the opposite. He didn't use his full power. Uh, And and, and it would be one thing if that was it, right? Where here's Jesus and here's who he is and here's what he can do, but he chooses less. That would be one thing, but it's even more than that. So let's look 
at uh, the next verse, Philippians 2, verse 7. It says this, Rather, he made himself, what? Nothing. He didn't just become less. He became nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So there's a few things here we just got to think about. Uh, everything became nothing. And, and, and it's, the text says that he took on the very nature of a servant. The Greek word there uh, can actually be translated as servant or slave. Servant is a little bit more palatable, right? We, we like that. We use that more often. But, but the term can actually mean slave as well. So think about that. So, well, God, I'd, lo- I'd, I'd love to sign up and serve you from time to time. That would be just great, and it would warm my heart, make me feel good about being a productive member of society and a, and a, and a person who's involved at my church, right? We do that. No, no, no. Like, it's, when, when you're a slave, when you have someone who is over you, who has ownership of you, um, you know, it's not optional whether you engage. Like, they say what to do, and we do it. But so many times in our faith, it's like we pick and choose, and we're more like, I'm a, I'm a kind of unwilling servant, so to say, as opposed to God, I owe you everything. You are not just my Savior, but you are my Lord. So when your word clearly speaks to me, regardless of what culture says, regardless of what I want to do, I'm going to be obedient, and I'm going to do whatever it is you say. And then the other part there, being made in human likeness, divinity actually wraps himself in humanity. Um, And so listen, uh, he was the most, but he chose last, right? Not just less, but last. Our culture really struggles with this, don't we? Because we want to be first, we want to win. Uh, that's why last week I told you this, and I want to mention it every week. I've kind of been encouraging people. Andy Stanley, uh, his newest book is called Not In It to Win It. We actually have some of these left in the bookstore. I think uh, we're ordering some more too because we sold most of what we had last week. And I just really want to encourage you guys, if some of these ideas and thoughts in this series about there's the scriptures and they speak in our culture, and when these things conflict, what do we do? If you really want to think about this and process this in a greater way, I really believe this book is a great resource and would encourage you guys to grab one at the bookstore, read through it by yourself in a small group with family members, with friends, whatever, and ask questions and process it. Um, It's so important, right? Like uh, we are not in it to win it in the ways of the world. We're not in it to win it using the ways our culture has typically Uh, used. We want to engage in the way that Jesus engaged. So even though we may deserve it, even though we may have fully earned it, we don't always take hold of it or take credit for it or open our mouths about it, right? Like this is what we see here in terms of what Jesus did. Why would the best offer to choose to become nothing? Because that is the mindset of our Lord and Savior, and it's what he invites you and what he invites me into, right? This is why. So we got to, like, do we choose our culture or do we choose the scriptures, right? Because this is what Jesus, Rob, we are the best. We, we do the most. We help the most. We give the most. We send the most money. Why wouldn't we sort of elevate that and take pride in that? Well, the problem is that that's what we've been doing, and it's, and it's actually had a negative impact. Why not try what Jesus invites us into? Can we just go one step further? I want us to look at the, how that, that passage ends. Um, Philippians 2.8 says this, And being found in appearance as a man, what does Jesus do? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So divinity doesn't just become humanity the greatest one ever chooses to humble himself and he didn't just go from the top of the heap to the bottom of the pile right he didn't just go from choosing less to being last but this is way more unfathomable than that brace yourself here right he was the most but he chose death 
death. And not just any death, a criminal's death, right? He died on a cross. He was crucified like a common criminal, even though he was the most and the best. So instead of showing you, I am right, what does Jesus do? He says, I'm going to show you my love. I'm going to show you just how much I love you. Um, Even though I'm right and you may not be, that's not important to me. Uh, it, it, it's like this. I ask the Lord, how much do you love me? And he said, this much. And he opened his arms and he died for you and for me. But that typically doesn't fire us up, does it? If you're a little bit older like me, maybe you remember uh, a movie from Oh, a couple decades ago, maybe. Uh, it was a Mel Gibson movie called Payback. And, uh, and I don't remember all the details of the movie, but I remember Mel Gibson's character was wronged, left for dead, right? A very common movie plot. And so basically he doesn't die and kind of shows up back on the screen uh, scene because he's owed his money and, and he's not getting his money back that was stolen from him. So he's basically systematically eliminating all these bad guys. Now, we love that, don't we, as a culture, as a country, this whole getting even, right? Uh, I, I'm, I gotta take revenge because I've been wronged, and I gotta sort of bring it back to evil. Uh, so we gotta get revenge. We gotta get even. We've gotta make things right. We've gotta have fairness. We love that plot. But the solution that Jesus models for us is the exact opposite of of that and and, and there's something um about others hating us and killing us that makes us want to get into the ring and fight back isn't there like we're like like let's go we can't let this happen we've got to take things out but let me ask you this if somebody wrongs us and we wrong them do we ever do this no i mean in a perfect world we would do this But even if we did this, people would feel wronged back and then they would do it again, right? Usually we do this. And then they respond and then we respond. Here's the problem with this way of living. When someone does something and we respond, that doesn't stop it. It escalates it, right? And things just get escalated and, and there's way more resources burned through. There's way more money spent. And it usually costs a lot more human life as well. It's just not worth it. So listen to me. Um, again, most, many of us aren't going to like this because it's not a cultural strength typically where we live. But listen, the solution to our reputation problem, to our arrogance problem, the solution that Jesus gives us is humility. We need to choose humility. Jesus chose this, right? Jesus chose to humble himself. He modeled this in how he lived in virtually every aspect of his life. And he invites us, you and me, to do the same. Does any of what we've read in the scriptures, does any of what we've seen in the life of Jesus sound like he wants us to get in the ring and have a fight? It doesn't, does it? Like, he didn't do this, and, and he didn't ask us to. But, but let's look. Look at the series graphic. Isn't it so good? We got the scriptures, we got culture, and, and we got the boxing gloves, right? Um, and there is a battle. There's a battle absolutely between what the Bible teaches us, in many respects clearly, and what our culture now says. There's this disagreement at so many points. And again, it sort of bubbles up into, man, like our culture's right and the Bible's wrong, and so Christians are even immoral, right? We talked about that a few minutes ago. But listen, instead of putting on the boxing gloves and knocking our culture out, um, what would things look like if we instead uh, lived our lives humbly? If we spoke humbly and we chose the mindset and the lifestyle of Jesus, right? This this idea of humility. And I get it. Like so many of you are like, Rob, like that would be great if we lived in a world that was perfect, right? But we don't, and and that's just not gonna work, right? Rob, that is not enough. 
what you're saying is way too soft. The culture is winning, and the Bible needs some powerful fighters. So we need to sort of, we need to train hard, and we need to bulk up so that we can fight back and we can win. Now, I, I, I do believe we should be more disciplined, that we should train harder, that, that we should work more. But let me just ask, if your perspective is that God needs more fighters and more people to sort of to, to do this and to win, um, are you, in your mindset and in your approach, choosing what the culture models or what the Bible models? Are you choosing what we see in our country and in our world, or are you choosing what, what Jesus did and how Jesus lived? Because we've seen this pretty clearly, I think, right? Like, Jesus offers a drastically different approach in a drastically different way that sometimes from our cultural vantage point seems lesser, but is way more powerful if we would only choose it. Let me, uh, let me end with a quote uh, Dr. Greg Boyd, who's a pastor of a church up in Minnesota, says this, Love is the only thing that is eternal. It's the only thing that ever began and will, uh, that never began and will never end because God is love. We get eternalized only to the degree that we are aligned with that love because everything else will be burned away. So the only thing that matters to anything is love. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? We kind of are living in a world right now that just sort of says Rob uh, or anyone else. You know, when the church is just talking about love and is all about love, it's too soft. It doesn't work. We need to respond to our culture and these crazy cultural issues that, that are totally anti-God and anti-Bible. We need to respond very clearly and very powerfully with truth. And I don't disagree that we need to sort of speak truth. But if people haven't seen our humble, loving posture, that truth will not be received and actually will result in a fight that causes us to become less instead of actually getting uh, what we want to share out. And before, again, you start diminishing love, let's go back to the scriptures. What, is, what, what does Paul tell us, right? Uh, in the end, there will be only three things that remain. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. If we all chose humility, right? If we all chose to be more kind and loving and to humble ourselves, I'm gonna be honest, that's not gonna vanquish all the craziness from our world, but it will go a long way to solving our reputation problem that we have as a country and that we have as American Christians, right? People view us um, in very interesting ways. And I just want to encourage us. Like, and, and, and you know what? Don't take my word for it. Read through the Gospels. Read through the New Testament. Read through the Bible. Uh, see what the Scriptures consistently advocate for. In particular, pay attention to what Jesus did and how Jesus lived. And if you come to a different conclusion, all I'm really encouraging you to do is to, is to live in the way that Jesus invites us, commands us, and models for us to live. That's really all I want you to do. Uh, you know, uh, today, this weekend, uh, there's actually 20 people, uh, about half of them from our church, from New Hope, uh, who are on a golf trip. And, uh, and so I hope that you enjoyed the message today and enjoyed watching it uh, on the screens. Hopefully, uh, for the 20 of us on this trip, having fun and we're actually doing some spiritual things and learning and growing together as well. But hopefully, we'll have had a lot of just a chip and a putts uh, these last number of days uh, on this trip. But uh, one of the things I love, and I hope you guys appreciate this too, I probably do a little bit more because I'm a dad, but I love how Christopher, my son, my oldest son, has been leading worship a bunch here at New Hope. And, uh, and he always loves doing that, and he jumps at the opportunity. And again, this might be my dad perspective, but I think he does it really well, and that's awesome. And so weeks ago, um, as he was preparing to lead worship this weekend, 
he, he was thinking about this message. I, he knew what I was going to talk about this weekend. And he said, hey, Dad, would, would this song uh, about control be a good way to end? And I said, oh, I think it'd be perfect, Christopher. Like this idea that we all want control, right? We all reach for control. We grab at control. Uh, and, and listen, the good news is that somehow God still loves us and wants us. But the idea is that we would give up our control and so today i'm just wondering for you and for me would we lay down a little bit of our our thought a little bit of our opinion a little bit of our preference a little bit of our control and yield to the mindset and the example of jesus and so jesus today i want to thank you so much Uh, for this conversation. Lord, I thank you so much for the consistent, clear teaching of Scripture. Jesus, you you model humility um, in undeniable ways. And then you invite us in all of our relationships to have and to model this exact same humility. And so I pray for us. I pray for us as a church. I pray for us as a body of believers that you would give us the strength, that you would empower us by your Spirit uh, to live in the same ways that Jesus modeled for us. And Lord, as we do this, I pray that you would surprise us by how our reputation in the world and our ability to influence others to experience Jesus in ways that changes them now and forever. I pray that that you would blow us away by how that would just increase and increase as we follow your way and as we live for you instead of following the example of our culture. God, help us to give up control and yield to your lordship in our lives. We ask together in Jesus' name, amen.